Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Munch and Learn. I'm Sarah Lorenz, the Special Events Manager here at the Dixon Gallery, and we have just a few reminders before uh, we launch into Kevin's talk. Um, we are recording the session, and for that reason, we do ask that you remain on mute. If you want to uh, re-watch a copy of this or any other Munch and Learn, you can find those on the Dixon's YouTube channel. And um, if you have any questions during the talk, we would encourage you to please type those into the chat. Kevin and I will go over those with everyone at the end. And um, at any point, you're welcome to uh, type those questions there. So now I'm going to introduce the Dixons, Linda W. and S. Herbert Ray Director, Kevin Sharp, to talk about Wayne Tebow. Kevin, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, Sarah Lorenz, and thank you everybody for, um, for joining us today. Um, before I before I get started, I should just tell you that um, you know I really am the sort of the worst kind of Wayne Tebow fan. I mean, you know, there's a lot of artists out in the world that I that I admire a great deal, um, but you know, Wayne Tebow, the work of Wayne Tebow, sort of changed my life in some ways, and and I've just had such admiration for the work ever since. And so if you're tuning in for, um, for a big artist takedown, you're, you're just not gonna get it today. Not from me, you know, he's just, he is a very special painter. And, um, and with that set up, I'm gonna share my screen. And so, and hold on, here's, and I'm hoping at this point you're seeing um, you're seeing we are a slideshow and and we're gonna come from the beginning and that's the name of my talk the wonder of Wayne Tebow and he is absolutely a one he is absolutely a wonder so I pose the question you know, what exactly is supposed to happen when an artist turns 100 years old, as Wayne Tebow did last November, November 15th? Well, the, the answer is someone better get busy organizing an exhibition. And in fact, somebody did. Um, Wayne Tebow 100 um, was organized by the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. Sacramento is where Wayne Tebow has lived um, these past 70 years. He moved to Sacramento in, 19, in 1950, and the Dixon was fortunate enough to, to jump on a really significant nationwide tour. Um, we are, um, we're good friends with the people at the Crocker. We're working, we're working together on, a, on another show. We're sending them an exhibition this fall, and, um, and it was just a really, really nice partnership um, all the way around. The Crocker, the Crocker as Wayne Tebow's, as Wayne Tebow's hometown museum, um, has the distinction, and this really is quite a distinction. They have the distinction of having organized a major Wayne Tebow exhibition every decade, every decade since the 1950s. So the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, tens, and now 20s. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of exhibitions. And as you'll also see, if, you, um, if you're a careful observer throughout the, the course of this talk, the Tebow family has been incredibly generous to, um, to the Crocker all these years as well. Now, the, the, um, the good news is they, the Crocker got the show open and there's, there's Wayne Tebow on the left and, and Scott Shields the exhibition's primary curator on the, on the right, standing before two seated figures, a work from, uh, from about 1965, I think. It's on loan from the Tebow Foundation. Um, and, you know, the show got open in Sacramento in October of 2020, but then, you know, our friend COVID came roaring back and California had to shut down. And so the show closed in Sacramento after only about three weeks, which had to be a disappointment. But I love this photograph. I love this photograph of Wayne Tebow. He's still, he's still um, just 99 in this, in this photograph, but he's knocking on hundreds door. But you know what the thing, I think it's this photograph um, says something 
about Wayne Tebow and Scott Shields and about artists and curators. Notice how close Wayne Tebow is standing to that painting. You know, I mean, artists are just used to being, you know, being close to works of art. And Scott, you know, is standing an appropriate distance away because anything can happen when you're having your photograph made. So, and, you know, anyway, I think I just found it, I found it interesting. The difference between the way artists interact with works of art and the way curators do might be summarized in this, in this photograph. So you may be asking, what makes Wayne Tebow such a wonder? You know, and, um, you know, I guess when you use a word like wonder, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a fairly personal word. And so I should preface everything I'm about to say with, to me. This is what makes Wayne Tebow such a wonder to me. So it may not have the same resonance for you, but I hope it, I hope it does. Well, and the answer is, first of all, Wayne Tebow is, in my view, one of the greatest painters in the entire history of painting. But, he, but he's also a regular guy who had jobs and worked for a living. And that sort of, that normalcy is, I don't know, it, it, it factors into his work. It's, um, but it's also, it, it makes him incredibly endearing. But, you know, lots of people are endearing and hardly anybody is one of the greatest painters to ever pick up a paintbrush. Now, there've been a lot of great artists out there in the world, but I think Wayne Tebow is one of a handful who just has a better understanding of what paint can be and do, what oil paint can be and do than, um, than almost anybody else. So getting back to that, that kind of regular guy stuff, I, here's Wayne Tebow in 1943. He's in the Air Force. He's um, working on working on a cartoon um, called Alec um, for, for the Mather Air Force Base newspaper in 1943. Um, I think if you'd have if you'd have stopped Wayne Tebow, 23 year old Wayne Tebow, and asked him at that time, would he rather would he rather be a great a great painter? or a cartoonist, he might, have, he might have chosen cartoonist. That cartooning became, I mean, it becomes a really important part of his work as an artist because, you know, the thing about making cartoons is that just that free hand, nobody wants an overly worked cartoon. And so that, that early immersion in cartooning really does inform his, um, his later work as a fine, as a fine artist. And then here he is in, 40, in 1944. This is Sergeant Wayne Tebow painting a, a B-29 aircraft at, at, um, at um, again, at Mather Air Force Base. And like I said, I just think it's the fact that, you know, he's, like I said, just kind of a, kind of a regular guy um, is part of, part of what makes his work so effective. And so now I love this self-portrait. This is the earliest work that's actually in the, in the Wayne Tebow exhibition. This is a, a self-portrait from 19, 20, 1947. So he's, he's 27 years old and look at him. You know, he's looking, he's, looking, he's looking very arty. He's not really committed to a career in the fine arts yet. Um, he's still working. He's he's still working as a graphic designer and a paste up guy at, at for a Rexall company in Los Angeles. Um, you know he uh, you know but you know you can you can you know with this kind of you know his longish hair and the scruffy beard he's starting to kind of look the look. Um, that won't really last very long. But you know but you know I, I love this work because of. Um, because of how, you know, arty he represents himself in a way. And he starts, you know, by, by about 1950, he, um, so 1950, he's 30 years old, and he finally graduates um, from college with a, with a degree in fine art. He goes on to get a master's degree. He's moved to San Sacramento in 1950, and he's teaching art there, and he's trying to find, you know, trying to find his way as an artist. And he's looking at you know, in, in 1955, abstract expressionism is, you know, absolutely the dominant style of art in this country. Um, you know, the, the, 
you know, the Jackson Pollocks and Willem de Koonings of the New York school are really, and, and not that that's what this is. I mean, this is a, this is a, a jackpot machine, a slot machine, basically. And, um, but it's painted in a very kind of unwayne Tebow way in terms of, you know, what we're thinking about, but he's still, uh, you know, he's still trying to find his way. I mean, he's, He's by 1955 a professor at um, in at uh, the university in Sacramento, and he's um, and he's looking at he's looking at lots and lots of art, and he's looking um, and he's trying to find his trying to find his voice, and he's working through this kind of almost expressionistic aesthetic, and um, but he it, but he won't stay there he won't stay there long. However, however. The, um, the things that he gets interested in early on, like slot machines, you know, this is a, this is a painting from, I think from 1999, and it's, um, and he's still thinking about this, this same object as a valid subject for, for his art. I, I found as I was, as I, you know, I've known the work of Wayne Thiebaud for a long time. Have I ever studied the work of Wayne Thiebaud? No, I just enjoy it. But I studied a little bit, you know, not much, but a little bit um, throughout to put this PowerPoint together. And this was something that I found very, very interesting, this, this resurrection of, of themes. Um, and then here's Wayne Thiebaud at his home in Sacramento in 1957. You can see, I told you, 10 years later, 10 years after that self-portrait, he's looking like he's looking like a television dad at this point. You know, he's he's a professor. He's got this, he's got a, a nice sweater. He's in his own home. Um, I don't really know who the artists are that he's looking at. Um, but, you know, it's. Um, he, he, he comes off as kind of a, a regular guy. And I think that's because he is. Okay, but here's the thing. To me, Wayne Tebow is a wonder because he can make paint do whatever he wants it to. And here's a photograph of him. I love this photo of him in 1961. He's at his house in Sacramento and the painting pies is um, behind him. And now we're starting to get to um, the Wayne Tebow that, you know, all of us, all of us know. And, you know, I kind of love it that he's sitting in front of this, this particular painting. I wouldn't be surprised if he's hung this particular painting outdoors, you know, um, but could be, maybe he's inside in a panel room or something, but it, it, it anyway. Um, and, you know, he's, he is still, you know, he's, he's, he's found himself really at this point. He's found his voice and that voice is really being heard at this point. This, in 1961, I think that's the year he also, um, he also develops a relationship with the art dealer, Alan Stone in, in, um, in New York. And Alan Stone will be really an important figure in, in launching the success of Wayne Tebow's career. But, he, but even though he's, be, he's beginning to know some pretty significant success, he continues to teach. He thinks of himself as, as a teacher, almost as much as an artist. And, um, but you know, in the next two or three years, in 62, he has a major show at the, at the uh, Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And I mean, we're seeing Wayne Tebow right here in this photograph, we're seeing Wayne Tebow arrive. And here's part of the reason why he's arrived. Now, this is a painting that's actually in the in the show. Another version of his of his pies. This one's called Pies, Pies, Pies from 1961, and it's in the collection of uh, of the Crocker. It's just a marvelous, marvelous thing. Um, and then, you know, this is Boston Creams from 1962, also in the collection of the Crocker. That um, and you know, it's just extraordinary and this is from from 1960 from 1962 but now here's here's what I'm getting at this is a this is a close-up photograph that I that I took with my phone I mean it's a you know it's a terrible photograph but look at the material itself this is what I'm talking about where Tebow can make paint do whatever he wants it to do and he can make 
paint look like the thing it represents. I mean, you know, if you look at this at this cherry and look at this, the white of of the of the meringue or the or the icing or whatever it is, it looks like meringue or icing. I mean, it's just so effective. I mean, a lot of artists can draw really well and make things look like they're supposed to look. You know, whether it's a whether it's a war horse or a coffee cup, but it's another thing entirely for the materials to have such an, uh, such an important role in, in creating another level of representation, that the materials represent just their physicality, represent things um, that, he, that he is painting. And I, I just think that's an extraordinary thing to be able to do. Now, and, you know, and it's like, well, paint, you know, it, it's kind of is like icing on a cake if you, you know, you know, and I guess, and I guess that's true, but he does, he does all these other things too. I mean, there's, I've, I've, there's, there, I've never really, I, I think there are very few artists who can make white, the color white be as expressively effective as Wayne, as Wayne Tebow does. And you can all, you can see it actually in, you know, in the background of this painting, all of his strokes, you know, I mean, he's like a, he, he's like a house painter. All of these in the best kind of way, all of these strokes are perfectly horizontal and perfectly parallel. They, they do such a great job of just, of just, I don't know, creating a, creating a context and an anti-context for these works to, in, for these two people who are totally not interacting, but it's giving them a context to inhabit. This is just, and this is the marvelous painting that Wayne Tebow and Scott Shields were standing in front of. But again, you know, look at that sock. Look at that sock on that on this man. You know, it's now the the tone is the tone is coming out a little warm because again, this is just my phone. But look at how you know how the little sags in the in that he makes these little sags in the socks with the paint itself. He's not really changing the tone. I mean, he does here because he has to make shadows on the, under the sags, but he's doing that with the physicality of paint. And that takes a level of skill that just goes beyond genius. I mean, like I said, there I can think of maybe maybe a half a dozen painters over the whole history of art. I mean, Jan van Eyck, could do this, you know. John Singer Sargent in the 19th century had a tremendous capacity to, to bend the material to his will. And Wayne Tebow can do that too. In my mind, there is no painter in the 20th century who is more skilled with paint than Wayne Tebow. Plus, I just happen to love, love his imagery. And I also love what he does with the color red. Look at how he, you'll find it when you come see the show. You will find it in the most unusual places, places where it clearly doesn't belong, like here, but it just works. It just works. And um, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's really a pretty significant skill to possess. Now, the other thing, the other thing I, I, that, I, that really makes Wayne Tebow special for me is that he knows art history and it comes through in the work in really, really interesting ways, I think. And you, and you can see it at the Dixon show, for sure. You know, for instance, he's, there's this, you know, this wonderful drawing. This is from 1978, it's a charcoal drawing. And it, it, it looks very much like, um, I mean, I have no idea whether Wayne Tebow was actually in a morgue and drawing this. I mean, the, if you look the model, has had some kind of accident. I mean, you know, his hand is bandaged here, um, but it's, but this reclining figure is, um, I mean, okay, so it's, it's, it's 1978. Wayne Tebow is 58 years old. He's still doing figure studies. That's, I mean, that should tell you something, a little something about Wayne Tebow. And what, what you can only see, you can't really see it in, the, in this, in this um, image, but he really kind of worked hard, even though the feet, the feet are very schematically drawn in. I mean, the wheels on this gurney are, are articulated much more carefully. But if when you come see this drawing in real life, you know, the, and maybe you can see it very faintly, he's moved these feet. You know, they were here 
and here originally, and he slid them over to the right to get the foreshortening a little more, a little bit more accurately in, um, expressed. And you know, but but we were talking about art history, and it makes this this drawing makes me think of nothing quite so much as Edward Manet's Dead Matador that's in the collection of the of the National Gallery. Again, the same reclining figure. You know, same foreshortening, turned a different, turned a different direction. But I'm pretty convinced that you know this is this is a work of art that Wayne Thiebaud knows. And um, and the other interesting thing is that you know he, he that drawing was from 1978, but that's not the first reclining figure he ever painted. And look what he's done. You know, this is a, a you know a painting of his of I think it's his daughter Twinka. Um, who is a fairly famous artist model um, in 1963. And think about, think about all the reclining women who appear in, in the whole history of art. You know, hundreds of them. And, and absolutely none of them look like this. This, is, this. this work isn't in the show. It's in the collection of the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville. It's just it's just a fascinating take on um, on on a, on a ubiquitous theme in, in um, the whole history of art. Now, this is a this is in the show. This is a painting of his um, of his wife Betty Jean Carr Tebow um, and book. It's from painted between 1965 and 1969, and um, it's also owned by the Crocker Art Museum. And it's a gift of Mr. And Mrs. Wayne Tebow. Um, and they made that gift shortly after Wayne Tebow completed the completed the work, and so a very generous thing to have to have given. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful portrait. And you know, Betty Jean, Betty Jean Carr Tebow, they married in in 1959. It was a it was a second marriage for for both of them. Um, they would stay married for another 50 years um, and um, and raise a raised a family together and, um, and she's just, um, you know, she's just lovely. And she's sitting, uh oh, sorry about that. She's sitting in front of, she's sitting in front of an art book. Now I tried and tried to figure out, you know, knowing that this painting was completed in 1969 and I've got some fairly old art books and, um, and I was trying to figure out, you know, I, I looked at three or four to see if I could figure out what art book it is um, and couldn't. Um, but, you know, he, but what I do know is that this painting, this painting is a painting of a drawing by Degas of a, an Italian art critic named Diego Martelli. And this is a drawing, is, a, is Wayne Thiebaud's painting of a drawing. So just the fact he's playing mind games with these materials of a George Seurat um, a boy in a, in a straw hat. And, you know, in case you don't believe me, there they are. Now, both of these works got, uh, this must be a book about drawings because both of these, the, the Martelli, um, this is a study by Degas. He actually makes a, full-blown portrait and this actually turns into into a painting as well but we're looking at drawings but you know the interesting thing is, to me anyway is that he somehow you know if you turn the book over so it's oriented correctly for us to view he's got Wayne Thiebaud has has Diego Martelli facing the wrong way and the George Seurat facing the wrong way. And I puzzled over this for longer than you know any human should have. I don't know. I mean, was he was he looking in a mirror as he painted? I just I don't I I, I don't have the answer. I just found it I just found it very very interesting. And I found it interesting that that Wayne Tebow thought it was important that whatever book was in front of of Betty Jean Tebow. That the that the images reproduced on its pages were legible to somebody like me. Okay, the other thing that you know, another little chunk of art history. When I see these these dairy cases with potato salad and you know all these other salads and stuff, um, you know, I think 
you know, I think of Gustav Kaibot's images of his his modern urban still life, so shop windows in Paris from the from the 1880s. Um, I'm not I'm not certain that Wayne Thiebaud has spent much time thinking about Gustav Kaibot, but maybe he has, because he sure you know this is a, a little etching that's that's in the show called Cake Window. And then the last little chunk of art history that, that I'll share with you, that I'll share with you um, right now is, um, this is just a sketch, but it's in the show. And it's a sketch of Clement Greenberg speaking about Hans Hoffman. Um, and it's a, a drawing he made in 1986 when he went to hear Clement Greenberg, you can see it written right down here, October of 1986. And Greenberg was speaking at, at Berkeley. Now, Clement Greenberg, Clement Greenberg um, is probably the most important art critic of the 20th century. Without Clement Greenberg, there would be no, um, there would be no Jackson Pollock. I mean, he was the great advocate of the New York School and persuaded the country that this, that Jackson Pollock's drips and and Franz Klein's gestures and Mark Rothko's um, sort of dream spaces were the, were the most advanced art that had ever been made. And Hans Hoffman was, um, was rather a teacher to all of, those, all of those artists and probably the oldest of the artists associated with the, with the New York School. Um, and so, you know, it was interesting to me and I, I think interesting to Scott Shields too, um, that at, at 66 years old, um, Wayne Tebow would go from, drive from Sacramento to Berkeley so we could hear Clement Greenberg speak. And he makes these two, you know, pretty persuasive sketches of the, of the by then, you know, aging critic. And, um, but the other thing I find very, very interesting is that on the same page, he made a little watercolor of candied apples. I don't know what that means necessarily. I just find I just find it interesting, and like I said, you know, I, it comes out of it comes out of Wayne Tebow's commitment to teaching. You know, I mean, we're at a point in 1986. We're well past the point when Wayne Tebow could have said, "I don't really need to teach anymore." But I think he liked the classroom, and I think he liked working with and helping to train younger artists and um and and i think he did what i don't know i mean he did what you know a really good professor would do which is he got in his car and he drove from sacramento to berkeley to hear clement greenberg one of the greatest critics of the of the 20th century so i mean i, I just find that i find that very i don't know what's the word i find it revealing in a way of who wayne tebow who wayne tebow is but I think Wayne Tebow is a wonder because he trades in ordinary objects, but reveals how truly extraordinary they are. And here's what I mean by that. I, I, I can tell, you know, in just about any show that comes to the Dixon that, you know, we put in our galleries, there'll be some object in that show that will hold my fascination for the entirety of the exhibition for the whole 12 week run. I'll go back and see it every day. And I'm quite convinced that this is the work in the TiVo show, you know, and it's pastel scattering. I mean, the, 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 the ruse is that he scattered some pastels on a, on a table and then, and then with, a, with pastel made pastel drawings of, his pastel sticks. And now, you know, I think he, you know, Scott Shields says, yeah, he didn't really do that. He did this from memory. And, um, and I, that could absolutely be the case. But what could also be the case is that he did toss these pastels onto a table. What, I, what I'm not able to tell is what the ground is. Well, I'm pointing to this like you could see me. Um, or see me doing that, you know, that what, yeah, I don't know whether this is, there's something on the surface of the paper. We're not looking at raw paper here. We're looking at something on the, something on the surface. And, um, and, 
it could be pastel or it could be a, it could be a wash and a light ink wash that he's put across it. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but I'll try to figure it out. Um, the media description in the book and on the label just says pastel on paper and it could well be. Um, but I also don't have any trouble believing that, that, that with this little nub of a yellow pastel, he made this complete pastel stick. You know, I don't have any trouble believing that with this little nub of, of, of indigo pastel that he made, he, that he colored the end of this green stick and colored all of these, all of these shadows. And, you know, and that this red stick, little nub made this red pole stick. And then, but also made all the little bits of red that you see throughout the composition. It, it is so auto-referential, you know, and so ordinary all at the same time. It's, I, I, I think this work, I think this work is genius. And, um, and, you know, like I said, I will be coming back to it again and again and again. I, I, I can pretty much guarantee. Um, this is a photograph, you know, of Wayne Tebow, um, of Wayne Tebow at Rice University in Houston doing a painting demonstration, doing a painting demonstration, paintings demonstration. And in 19, 1971, it's, um, I mean, stuff that he, uh, like I said, by 1971, he really didn't need to do, but continued to do. I like the fact that a guy who um, spends his, so much of his career painting pies and cakes um, likes to wear an apron when he works. That kind of, I kind of enjoyed that. But he also, you know, he's the kind of guy that when he goes and does a paintings demonstration at Rice University in Houston, he puts on a bow tie. He puts on a tie, you know. Um, he is not, he may have for a short time been that kind of scruffy artist that we saw in 1947 when he was 27 years old. But at a certain point, at a certain point, you know, that's, a, I think that stopped being him really, if it ever was. And I like the fact that it's a striped tie. It may have been this one. We'll never know. But again, it's these ordinary things that he somehow, in, you know, infuses with not grandeur, but with something special that, that makes you notice them in ways that you wouldn't notice them otherwise. You know, same thing with the, with the eyeglasses. You go back, you know, yeah, the guy wears glasses. And so when you come to the show, you're going to see dark glasses. You're going to see regular glasses. You know, he, the guy paints his glasses. And this is a little gouache painting. And what you're seeing, so, we're, so far we've seen oil paint for sure. He just he just knows how to work with oil paint, but he's also, you know, he's also very attracted to drawing and charcoal, and you'll see some of that. We just saw a, a pastel that I'm slightly fixated on, and now he's working he's working in gouache. This is just a very old school way of working. This is what this is what Degas did in the 19th century. You know, explore different media for different expressive outcomes. This is. You know, he's it, it, it may be it may be a little old fashioned in some ways, but, you know, but I love it. You know, this is this is to my mind. This is what artists are supposed to be doing. They're working and experimenting and experimenting within. I don't know, within boundaries, you know, and those boundaries are time tested and mattered and Wayne and Wayne Tebow respects the materials. You know, I love this. This is a, another pastel, you know, just a, a slice of watermelon with a knife in it. And, you know, the interesting thing is, I mean, it's, a, it's not a large work, um, relatively, you know, relatively small, in fact. Um, but it just speaks, you know, it's got a, it's got a, 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 it's got a certain power. And this is a work that, he, that he's a, a made in, um, in 1989. And the interesting thing is there's a, you know, he makes his, when he works in his sketchbook, there are these little tiny sketches. It really surprised me. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's almost like what, you, you know, what you did when you were really poor, when you were a kid to maximize the, you know, the amount of drawings you could make on any given sheet of paper. And that is how his sketches, his sketches, there, there'll be a half a dozen drawings on one sheet of, on one 
fairly small sheet of paper and he does a fully blown worked up sketch in graphite or ink, I can't remember which, that's right next to this pastel um, to get to this, you know, to get to this pastel. I mean, again, I find it incredibly interesting. And then, you know, and, and then another very ordinary thing, you know, a couple of jolly cones, you know, and this is very, you know, this is very Wayne Tebow kind of classic subject, but there's still, there's still just these ordinary, these ordinary things, but sometimes the ordinary things wind up in very extraordinary places like um, the cover of the New Yorker in um, 2002, in August of 2002. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you tuned into the panel discussion last Sunday, um, which was so interesting with, with Scott Shields and Tweek, Twinka Tebow, um, Wayne Tebow's daughter and an artist who wrote for the catalog and, um, and a, a scholar and um, who wrote for the catalog as well. And um, one of them shared with me that, that Wayne Tebow, you know, early on, I mean, this is how seriously he wanted to be a cartoonist. He, he sent lots and lots of cartoons to the New Yorker, hoping, them, hoping they would be published. And none of them were, none of them were. Um, I mean, at a certain point, you know, I, he kind of, I guess, kind of gave up on it. But he's done, I think, something like 10 New Yorker covers. <laughs> it's just funny, that whole, that whole fine, that whole fine art and commercial art distinction doesn't really, doesn't really seem to matter much to Wayne Tebow. It's, it's interesting, it's interesting. And I'll say this, Wayne Tebow is a wonder because he never stops looking for new inspiration and new subjects. And, um, and I'll just walk you through. So here's Wayne Tebow in the, in the 1980s and, um, and you can see he's in his studio, got this kind of ordinary Bentwood chair. He's got, you know, perfectly normal easel. A uh, well-used easel, and you know, and he's making. You see all these, all these landscapes that he starts doing. You know, I first took notice of him in the in the in the nineteen eighties. But he's also got this wheel of cheese up here hanging on his hanging on his studio wall. And I think, I think, it's a painting on paper. These all look to me like they're like they're on like they're paintings on paper studies for the more developed canvases that he's going to make. Uh, you know, they're like the one sitting on his on his easel, uh, and these are probably panels, you know, or small canvases, but kind of look like panels to me somehow. Not that any of this particularly matters, but the wheel of cheese. Ah, look at that! The wheel of cheese turns up in our in our exhibition. You know, slice circle, 1986. It's an oil on canvas, courtesy of the Paul LeBaron Tebow. Paul LeBaron Tebow was Wayne Tebow's son, um, and but there's that there's that wheel of cheese, and there's that that uncanny ability to make you know to paint with white and to have this white wheel of cheese sit on this white background and still have it still have it you know still be able to see it, still be able to differentiate it. And some of it is, has to do with the way he, way he works the materials. And also look here, you know, look at how many different colors we have of the cheese itself. I mean, it's just so, it's, it's, such, a, it's such thoughtful work. I mean, this is, a, this is an incredibly generous artist. And when I say generous, I mean, yeah, probably in material ways too, but he's generous with those of us who take the time to look at his art. You know, he goes, he goes the extra mile. And I just love this wheel of cheese. It's in the exhibition. It's an oil on canvas, but it's not the one hanging in his studio. And you know how I know? Hey, you can't really answer me. The shadow is on the other side. So he's worked up a fully developed study of this wheel of cheese so he can turn it into this wheel of cheese. That is a hard working artist willing to go the extra mile for me and couldn't be more grateful. Couldn't be more grateful. So here's, um, here's the thing he does that he, that he does in, um, 
in the, it starts doing in the 1980s, I think. Um, you know, he starts painting landscapes, you know, and I discovered Wayne Tebow in the, um, in the 1980s. You know, I, I wrote about it in The Leaf. You know, I just, you know, I, I, I just good fortune. I, I happened to, go, I lived in Kansas City in the, in the mid 80s and I, you know, I wasn't working in museums yet, um, but, I, but um, I was kind of starting to sort of figure them out a little bit. And I went to the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City, which is a, which is a monster of a museum, a great museum. And I think I just went for something to do on a Sunday afternoon. I don't know that I, you know, remember, I'm not getting any email blasts in 1986. I'm not getting, you know, I'm, I, you know anyway, I just went because I like going, I like looking at the collection. And, but I saw the, the, uh, the Wayne Tebow retrospective that was organized in San Francisco and traveled to four or five venues across the country, just like this show is. And I saw these paintings. And of course, the, in, the, the installation was in chronological order. So I'm seeing you know, I don't remember seeing any of, uh, you know, the self-portrait of the scruffy artist from 1947. I, my memory of it, it might have been there, but my memory of it is, is starting with the pies and cakes and, and all, the, all the various confections. And I was just overwhelmed. You know, it was love at first, it was love at first sight. And I have to say, I have to say that, um, you know, after falling, falling in love with all those confections, when I got to when I got to the, the landscapes that were his most recent work, he kind of lost me a little bit. It's like, I don't really understand why, what he's doing here. Why is he painting? Why is this, this man with this incredible interior um, vision in a way, this vision of, of objects that, you know, in controlled spaces where, you know, he's, you know, it, it's all him and nobody and nobody else really, does he put himself out in the world like this? And I don't really understand, you know, these landscapes are all distorted and, you know, they're kicked up, you know, I mean, yeah, San Francisco, which is, I think, probably what we're looking at here. I mean, very hilly city, but, um, but it's not, the, it, it doesn't look like this exactly. But, it, you know, like all of his work, it, it, it won me over, you know, and these landscapes, you know, in this one, I mean, look how, you know, I, what I love about this, you know, in addition to, you know, all the things that, that kind of put me off at first, I now love, I love the fact that he's playing with perspective and distorting it and kicking things up and flattening things out and messing around. But he's also interested, like many artists are in the act of making a mark. OK, making a mark on a piece of paper, on a drawing, whatever, uh, on a canvas, whatever it might be. But you know how else you can make marks when you, you can make marks with the tires of your car when you're going down steep hills and hit the brakes or peel out going up, trying to get up the hill. I just, you know, it's like it's so incredibly smart. So this is Street and Shadows from, you know, from 1982 or something like that. Um, and it continues. He begins, to, he gets interested in the, in the Sacramento River and painting the Delta. And this is a painting called Why River from, you know, now 15 years later in 1998. And this painting is, this painting is huge. And then this is a painting from, from um, 2019. 29, so he's 99 years old. And he's still invested in this in this incredible subject that he's that he's now been exploring for you know for you know going on forty years and still looking at some of these same devices and vehicles, you know. And now he's he's doing it all from memory, and that's what most of his work is done from. But it's so it's just so fascinating to me. And then at some point. At some point, when he's about ninety-five years old, he be, he begins to make a series, a, a new series of paintings. I mean, the very idea. I mean, that alone qualifies him in my book as a as a as a wonder, not to mention a national treasure. But it's it, these clowns are just kind of funny, 
and interesting. And it, and it goes back to, you know, all his, all his many interests over, over time. Um, I mean, he painted clowns, you know, years before as well, but he starts this series and they seem, I don't know, elegiac in a way, you know, here's a clown angel and dog um, from the same, from the same series. Now, some of his, you know, some of his technique has, um, his technique has changed. I mean, and he actually, he, see these, these are actual gouges in the surface of the paint, you know? And I think, you know, it, it, this is not that, you know, oh, he can't handle the paint anymore. This is him actually doing this on purpose for some reason. And, you know, I mean, and you can interpret it in lots of different ways, you know, is, you know, I mean, and I'll say this, this, I didn't put it in the slideshow, but this paint, it's got like, there's hair and stuff, paint, you know, paintbrush hair, it, you know, in the paint up here, you know, it's, it's intentionally, I mean, it's intentionally coarser than his earlier work. Now, it's not a repudiation of his earlier work. I think it's just a, a, an acknowledgement that, you know, the times have changed. Times are different. And then he ends, you know, with these, these clown boots from 2018, 2019, you know, and, and, um, and they're just kind of, they're just kind of funny and, and, you know, beautiful in their own way and special. So during that, during, you know, about, you know, just over a year ago, during the worst part of the pandemic, you know, this painting, this painting sold at auction at, at Christie's. Um, it's a big painting, 68 by 72. It's as big as the biggest paintings in the, in the show. Um, and it sold, well, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you how much it sold for because it's, you know, it's really, the intrinsic value of the work that matters, you know, it's, um, you know, but it's sold for a lot. And there's Wayne Tebow in 2020. He says, I, you know, I, he says he believes in the mass and I hope he's, I hope he's well vaccinated. And I, I hope he, you know, I genuinely hope he lives another hundred years. And so all I can, I'll just end by saying, you know, thank you, Wayne Tebow. And many thanks to all of you for, for joining me today. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, and I'll stop sharing my screen here so I can see all of you. Well, thanks very much, Kevin. I know I speak for everyone in attendance about how much we enjoyed that. And also, I can't wait to go downstairs, see the oil pastels, and see if I can figure out where his feet moved from, the man laying down. That was very an interesting tidbit, yeah. too. Yeah, we it have is. It is. It's a show. It's a show that rewards careful looking. Just you know, I mean, every show does. Every show does. But but this one, um, this one is. It's very much the case. The the more time you give, the more time you give Wayne Tebow, the more he is going to reward you. That's awesome. That's um, I, we have a couple comments and questions in our chat. Abby asks if any of Tebow's students went on to become famous? Uh, you know, I really, I really don't know. I'm sure, um, I don't know about famous necessar necessarily. Um, I mean, Wayne Tebow knew a lot of artists. I don't know that, and some of them were probably less than, less than formal students. I mean, he was great friends with Mel Ramos, but Mel Ramos wasn't really a, um, wasn't really a um, a student. I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't really know, Abby. You know, it's. Um, I haven't really. I haven't really delved that deeply into his into his career as a, as a teacher. I mean, you'd have to think that um, anybody that had the good fortune to study with with Wayne Tebow would would probably be a, a much better painter for the experience. So. Um, yeah. Good question. Let's see if I can find out. Pat Gordon um, of Muddy's fame mm -hmm. comment that how could you not love someone who had so much enthusiasm for the ordinary loveliness 
of ordinary of things like school supplies and cake. And she also says that she has a poster of Wayne Thibode behind her uh, right now. <laughs> um, Lori Luthi says that has a question and a comment. She said that Thibode visited Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois back in the 60s and her painting professor was lucky enough to be his assistant. Ah. And her question is, did the, does the exhibition have any of his sketchbooks on display? Sketches, but not sketchbooks. You know, they're they're at this point they've been they've been pulled from the books and have, and are are framed. There's there's you know uh, there's probably a half a dozen of them or more throughout the show, and um and they're you know they are you know not the not the confections that um necessarily you know grab your attention, but again it's they they will reward you if you spend some time with them. You know that 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 those those, those sketches. Um, that he made of Clement Greenberg and the candy and apples. Is it, I'm sure that would, I'm sure that originated in a, in a sketchbook. And, you know, this is off, off topic a little bit, but, you know, while I have you all here, you know, I mean, we work really hard to try to pair exhibitions in, um, of our local artists with, you know, you know with um, the shows that are in uh, the larger shows that we do. And right now, you know, we we've, we've paired Wayne Tebow with the, the Memphis artist uh, Greeley Myatt. His Greeley show is called Piece of Cake. Um, confections, delicious confections from Greeley Myatt or something like that. Anyway, and it's these are little sculptures that he makes of cakes and cookies and, and ice cream cones and that he has given to friends over the years. And it, they are they look absolutely delectable. And um, and so it's just a it's just a really good moment at the Dixon and a really nice pair of shows. So when you come see Tebow, come see Greeley as well. Or when you come see oh, Greeley, come see Tebow as well. We have um, a number of comments that are saying almost the same thing about how much they're they've enjoyed this talk and look good. forward to seeing the exhibit. Or actually, Irene said she came last week, and I appreciate this insight. So. If we don't have any more questions and you have a moment or two to type them, if you do have questions, I'll tell you about next week. We will be hearing about the architecture of a country house by John Staub, who is the architect that built the Dixon's residence. And the gentleman giving that talk is an architectural historian named Stephen Fox. If you're not currently a Dixon member, we do invite you to join. And also to remember that Dixon memberships make great gifts. And we also invite you, like Kevin said, to come in person, see this exhibition, see the complimentary exhibition by Greeley Maya. And you'll have a couple more months to see both of those. There is a recording of Sunday's panel discussion on YouTube and the link has just been placed in the chat. Now we have a concluding question from Lori. Would you discuss Thibaut's technique of halation? Did I put <laughs> that correctly? Yeah. No, <laughs> I have no idea what that word means. It's on. A, I do know that it's on a, on a text panel, but I, I, I I'm going to have to I'm going to have to study up. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. It's yeah. It, I, you know it. I don't know exactly. Um, I don't know. I, it's a term that is completely unfamiliar to me. I promise. I will. I will learn it. <laughs> Uh, you know, because it's right there in the right there on the text panel, but I haven't learned it yet. Julie, Maybe just, Julie, she just gave made a comment. It's about a halo effect. Ah, well, you know that does happen in his in his work. It, it, I don't know that it's so much a, a halo effect, but I guess it is. I mean, it could work. It could work in any number of ways, and I'm not sure quite how they're thinking of it. But you know. When I talk about all those all those beautiful horizontal lines, parallel lines that are the, just basically the brush strokes that make up the backgrounds, the surfaces of, of his of many of his paintings, you know, he still has to cut in around the object that he's painted, and that does create a kind of haloing effect with the with the paint itself, with the material itself, and that could be what they're getting at. But it's also there's also um, you know, he, he, he does tend to do these, these, these very subtle 
and not subtle outlines of, of the objects like that shoe I showed you that and the sock where where it's where this blue sock is outlined in red for you know no apparent reason except that it makes that sock and shoe pop a little bit so it could refer to either one I'll study I promise um, I'll do my homework well actually Lori answers a bit of her own question good uh, and I think this comment's interesting she says that Wayne's shadows are just as exciting as some of the objects and subjects. Yeah. And True. she understands that word to be his method of using complementary colors mm. in his work and it makes the colors vibrate. Well, yeah, he, I, I'm sure she's, I'm sure she's right about that too. And that's kind of what I was getting at with the, you know, with those red outlines against, you know, not the red and blue are complementary, but colors, but, um, but they do, they do, it does create kind of a vibration and it wouldn't surprise me that um, an artist who handles materials as effectively as Wayne Tebow would be thinking about how, how a thing like halation actually works. I wonder if he does. I wonder if he uses that term. Well, actually, Lori also tells us he invented the term. This, uh, this Lori is a, is a very helpful guest, isn't she? <laughs> I like how much she's paid attention to. I know, I know, I know. Good. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for you. joining us and thanks to everyone for joining us. Oh, Lori. Okay. This is interesting. Lori says he was featured in her thesis. I'm um, saying it again. He was featured in her thesis. Ah, uh -huh. there you go. Well, you know, jot down Lori's name. Maybe she does a munch and learn before the show's over. Right. Or becomes a docent at the Dixon. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Lori, are you local? Are you here? No, no. Be a long way, maybe a long way to go to be a docent. But we're, we're glad you're here today. You'd be with us virtually. And we're, I'm glad that my, my friends, Melody and Abby, are, are here and seem to have behaved themselves for, you know, for like 60 consecutive minutes, which might be an all time record. <laughs> and um, I love you guys. Great to see you. Thanks for tuning in. All right, everyone. Thanks for being here with us. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.